I don't know if you had noticed, but what I had been doing in uh, the month, uh, you know, this month have been the I am sayings of Jesus. He you know, made a number of statements, I am. What I was surprised when I was uh, doing some of the preparation and planning, I realized I'd already preached a couple of those here, so I, didn't, uh, so I wasn't going to repeat them. But this morning, I'm going to be looking at one that's found in John chapter 11, I have 17 to 44 on the, uh, uh, in the bulletin. Uh, I may be reading a lot longer than that. I don't like to read long passages, but it's just too rich to just leave, uh, you know, just pick a little bit out. But uh, like I said, we'll be looking at John chapter 11. 400 years before the birth of Christ, Socrates, a renowned Greek philosopher, uh, was, uh, had offended some people in high places and he was sentenced to death. And the honorable way, but because he was so respected, they, uh, they just they required him to just uh, drink poison, some hemlock, if you remember the story. And as he uh, drank the hemlock and lay down to die, so one of his disciples asked him, shall we live again? And the dying philosopher could only reply, I hope so, but no man can know. I've, uh, I've studied a lot of different religions, especially in uh, the Asian religions, and every, every religion deals with the uh, with you know, this, con uh, this question about death and what takes place afterwards. Every civilization, every religion, uh, culture, they know that there's something beyond this life. The ones that are atheists, they don't believe in God. You know, they say, well, we just cease to exist. But they come to that position by learning or or by making some decisions. It's innate within all of us that there's a God, we're accountable to God, and there's something that takes place after death. Yeah, for example, I can, uh, you know, in Egypt, uh, they believed in life after death, and of course they built the pyramids and other big tombs for great people, and, uh, and they would uh, put, uh, they'd embalm them, put food in, and they'd, uh, and they'd seal some, they'd put some of the slaves in there to serve them after in the afterlife, and, uh, and so they knew that there was going to be something afterward. The Hindus, they believe in a reincarnation, and this endless cycle of, of coming back as something else, and depending on how you lived before, if you were enlightened and lived a good life, I mean, you might become, you know, one of their sages or one of their, um, I'm trying to remember what that word is, uh, well, they could be a, become a holy person, or even become a god, and, uh, and or if you were bad enough, you could come back as a cockroach. So you just it was an endless cycle of just uh, you might come back in the lower caste or in the higher caste, depending on what you did. Buddhists believe in reincarnation also, and but with, and there there's enlightenment through enlightenment and getting rid of self. Uh, you can actually become one with the great power out there. They, they didn't call them God, uh, just great power. And, but where you look, completely lose your identity, you lose yourself as you become one with this power. So, and then, uh, but the question still lingers, shall we live again? And of course, my answer, and I'm positive your answer would be yes. We can know that we will live again. Jesus makes a very powerful statement, a very strong statement concerning death and resurrection when he said in John eleven twenty five to 26, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. See, because of his resurrection, all that Jesus said, all that Jesus taught was verified. It was true. He said he would be put to death. He said he would be raised to a new life, that he would be raised again. It all took place as he said. And because of that, we can put our faith in what he has taught us 
that's been passed down through the centuries. And we are assured of resurrection and eternal life, and no other religion can come close to what God offers through Christ. No one. And I've studied almost every one of them, even the Muslim faith. They hope they can get into heaven. If they die in jihad, oh, that's right. That will move you right in. Yeah, with jihad is holy war. You move right into a paradise. That's why they're willing to kill themselves because uh, they want to get into heaven. Yeah, but Jesus said he's the way into heaven. He's the uh, resurrection and the life. So I want us to look at this passage. Uh, and... I'm going, to, I'm going to go back to verse 1 so we can see where we're going. And I'm going to skip some uh, because, like I said, I don't want to read all 44 verses to you. Uh, but anyways, it says, Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, in the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And it was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. And then you see that they had sent to Jesus, saying, my brother is sick, please come and, yeah, and heal him. And, uh, and so then it goes on to say that Jesus delayed. He delayed uh, two more days. And, uh, and then he said, we're going back. You know, so he uh, stayed two days longer in the place in verse 6. Where he was, verse 7, and then after this he said to his disciples, let's go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, the rabbi, the Jews just, you know, just now are seeking to stone you and you're going there again. And, uh, and then he drops down, as you go down in, the, in verse 10, he said, but if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Then he said this, then this he said, and after that, he said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of his sleep. And then the disciples said to him in verse 12, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. But now Jesus had spoken of his death and they thought he was, uh, he was speaking of literal sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. But And I am glad that for your sakes that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. And then uh, Thomas, uh, verse 16, therefore Thomas, who was called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, let us go also so that we may die with him. So when Jesus came, so when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning her brother. Martha, therefore, when she had heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. Mar Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. And when she had said this, she went away and called Mary, her sister, secretly. The teacher is here and he's calling for you. And when she heard this, she got up quickly and was coming to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house were in consoling her. When they saw her, that Mary got up quickly, went out. They followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Therefore, when Mary came to where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews that came also with her weeping, uh, he was deeply moved in his uh, spirit and was troubled and said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. 
So the Jews were saying, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from also dying? So Jesus, again, being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave, and the stone was lying against it. Jesus said, remove the stone, Martha. The sister of the deceased said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he'd been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. And when Jesus then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it, so that they may believe that you sent me. And when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The man who had died came, out, came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him, let him go. And therefore many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done believed in him. And then it goes on to say, but some didn't believe. It's a long passage, but it's a, to me, uh, you have to get the whole picture of what was taking place here. And so I want us to see some truths in here about, being, about Jesus being the resurrection and the life. See, Jesus had the power over death and life. He had power over the death and life. He came to win a victory over life uh, or over death. See, sin and death came as a result of sin. I know in the world uh, today, a lot of the philosophers uh, say, well, this is just a natural extension of life. You know, we go through it. You in one sense, we see it, but death is an enemy. The Bible says death is an enemy. Death is a curse for the sin of mankind. One day when Jesus does return, he's going to wipe away all sin and death. And, he, and by his own resurrection, he gained victory over death. And we who are his, we share in that victory. See, death is our enemy, but Jesus is our life. He is our life. He's the one who gives us life eternal. Jesus had come for the purpose of dying for us. He came to pay the penalty for our sin. And he also came not only to, 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 again, to die for us, but to defeat death by himself being raised from the dead. He conquered death. He showed us that what he is, he is Lord over, he is Lord over life and death. He is our Lord. He's God. He created life and he's the one who gives life. And in this passage, we see that Jesus displayed his power by raising Lazarus from the dead. He purposely delayed his time to go to Lazarus. He, didn't really, he, he had a purpose. It, it, it wasn't that he didn't care. I mean, he really cared for Lazarus. He wasn't being mean. But God was wanting to do something to show the people something of who Jesus really, truly is. So by, so by the time he get, got, I mean, he could have just spoken the word when he got the word and Lazarus would have been healed long distance. But he spoke the word. I mean, uh, but anyways, by Lazarus being in the dead, being dead for four days, it confirmed that he is indeed dead they would the jews said that there's a possibility of coming back in two days you know and we've heard of people who they all signs of being dead but then they come back to life uh after a, a day or two but they it was confirmed that yeah he was definitely you know he was definitely dead and that gave opportunity to show forth jesus glory and god's glory See, people knew that only God has the power over death and life. And by raising Lazarus from the dead, Jesus displayed his deity of who he is. And this was observed by so many people. No one has been able to raise anyone from the dead. And we prayed for people and, and you know, maybe God could bring somebody back who might have 
go 20 minutes and then come back. But nobody could raise somebody who'd been dead for four days. And that gives us hope. See, the ultimate display of power is his own resurrection. Lazarus later died again. He died. But when Jesus died, he was raised from the dead. He conquered death, and he's eternal. And we share in that. So Jesus has power over life and death because he is God incarnate. God made flesh. God came to earth to pay the penalty for our sins because he loved us so much. He gave himself for us so that we could receive his righteousness, his, well, his cleansing, his righteousness, and eternal life. Now, the word eternal is, you have to compare that to God. God is eternal. He is past, he is present, he is future. There is no beginning or end. God is light, he's glory. His light shines. There is no darkness in him. And so when we have eternal life, we not only have like everlasting life, we share and we, we receive eternal life, life without end in the joy, in the light, in the presence of Jesus. And that's awesome. And we can, and it's a present reality right now. It's a present reality. Jesus is the source of eternal life. Life is found in Jesus. Because as we believe in him and put our trust in him for eternal life, we experience, we receive that eternal life. You see, a person can, gets eternal life through Jesus. There is no other way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. And he came to pay the penalty for all people. When Alka was a, a, a teenager, she was seeking some kind of meaning in life. What is the purpose of life? Why are we here? She was that philosophical type person. I'm not. Uh, yeah, but she was seeking. Uh, in a Japanese home, uh, they have, uh, they, they, most, the Japanese are primarily like 95% Buddhist and 95% Shinto. Huh? Uh, they're both. Yeah, to be Shinto is that God is in everything there, so they have rocks and trees, but they don't have idols. And in the Japanese home, they'll have a little God shelf up here for the Shinto shrine. And uh, they might have a candle, they might, uh, uh, you know, they'll put some uh, food, some water out there, but they don't have a God. But then he, every home has a Buddhist altar and for the ancestors. And they would put food out and they have the, you know, they might have a little Buddha here and they have the pictures of the ancestors. And every day they would uh, uh, clap their hands and do things, uh, you know, you know, bow, give reverence to the ancestors and to uh, the Buddha. And they would also go to temples. And Tina Nalka was looking and one day she was saying, how does God get in that little box? And yeah. How is God in that statue? So she was searching for something. She, there was an emptiness within. Something she knew there was something missing. And then she heard the word that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And, and that's what she was searching for. The truth, for life, for meaning, and for purpose. And then she heard John 3, 16. For God so loved who? The world. Everybody in it. And, uh, and she came to realize that Christianity just wasn't for the Westerners, you know, for Americans or Europeans. It was for all people. She gave her life to Christ as a result. It filled that hole within her heart. And, now, yeah, she, uh, and she was so excited because now she had meaning and purpose. She had eternal life and she had the joy of Jesus in her. Like I said, that eternal life is a present possession. We don't have to wait until our new bodies are resurrection. We have it right now. And see, this life, in this life, eternal life, we will never die. And life, this life comes only to those who believe in Jesus. He said in John 20, verses 27 to 28, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And they follow me, and I give eternal life to them. 
and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Isn't that wonderful news? Even when we are weak, when we're not doing, you know, when we might have some doubts, or we may have some concerns, or we're, we're grieving, we're hurting, or, or we may not even be thinking about God, we don't have to worry because we give our lives to Him. No one can ever pluck us out of His hand. We are secure in Him. Jesus is our life. Jesus is our hope of resurrection. Jesus is our source of eternal life. There is no other way. See, for the believer, death is not the end of life, but a transition from this existence into the next. That's why Jesus could say uh, in his passage that I am the resurrection and the life. And that uh, he who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. We, uh, yet, yet we experience physical death here. But it's a transition. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. In verse 8 of that chapter, We are of good courage, I say, rather, prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. See, when we die, we go directly into the presence of God. Remember the thief on the cross? When was he going to go? The thief said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what did Jesus say? Today, Today you're going to be with me. See, we, it's not like a soul sleep or whatever. We actually go into the presence of God. And, and I love this, uh, this thought that Jesus actually comes to us. He's the one who comes to get us. In uh, John 14, verses 2 and 3, Jesus said, To my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For if I go and prepare a place for you, okay, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So what I'm seeing in here is that Jesus, when our time is ready, Jesus is the one that comes and escorts us home. He's the one that greets us. And you've seen those, uh, those pictures, you know, with uh, like the first day in heaven, the person just hugging on Jesus. I think that's a pretty good picture. I think that's a great picture. See, our bodies will die, but our spirits live on. Our soul, our spirit continue to live. You know, it's a transition to a spirit world, the unseen dimension that's all around us. And we will have spiritual bodies made that are perfect for that existence. And then when Jesus comes, he establishes in the uh, new heaven and a new earth, there's going to be, you know, in the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven and this new heaven and new earth. And we're going to have a physical bodies per made perfect for that. Those bodies that will never get sick, never die. There will be no more sorrow. All of that stuff, all that pain is going to be behind us. We won't remember that, and we'll be enjoying the presence of our loved ones and friends. And, and you know, I've got some pretty wild ideas. I think we'll be able to travel to other planets and other things, too. I, I don't know what he has, but what he's got is far better than any we can, thing we can possibly imagine. You know, he's going to come and destroy the earth as we know it, and do away with the curse of man's sin, and it's going to be a perfect place. And it's going to be greater than anything we can ever imagine. And so then Jesus always acts to bring glory to the Father. And I wanted to say that for the last. You know, Jesus always acts to bring glory to the Father and to strengthen our faith. He said that in here in this passage that we had read. Uh, that you know, he wanted them to learn to tr believe in him. And he made an impact in the lives of the, uh, of the, the disciples, of Mary and, uh, and Martha, and those who had seen him. And all people could do is give glory to God. And that's what he wants to do. That, see, he was glorified by raising Lazarus from the dead. And you know, he, he, Lazarus' death was for God's glory. 
And God can still get glory even today when people die. I've seen, you know, we, we, there was a funeral we did up in Caribou, Maine. Um, this, this, this man had, uh, had died suddenly of a heart attack. Uh, he was, I think, like 55 or something. And, and it, oh, the weather was horrible, you know, the day of the funeral. And uh, it was raining and raining. It was cold. And I, mean, well, we were, I was praying, and I think a few of the others were praying, Lord, just open up the sky. Well, we came in at the funeral procession, and as soon as we turned into the gate, into the, uh, into the cemetery, it stopped raining. And then when uh, everybody got out, the sun actually poked its head out. We had, and then when we were done with the graveside, we left, and as we left, it started raining. God was glorified in that. We've never forgotten that. We've seen God do great and wonderful things. And we have a hope that no one has. And that assurance that to be absent from the bodies to be present with our Lord. So, I mean, God displayed, or G God displayed his power through Jesus. And God was glorified. Jesus was glorified. And his deity was proclaimed. People believed and trusted in Jesus. And as you get into the word and you, you, uh, you see what he did, he strengthens our faith in who he is and gives us assurance that we are God's, that he is at work, and that he uses us to bring glory to him. See, Jesus strengthened the faith of his disciples and his followers. Yeah, he knew that they were going to be facing that time after his crucifixion. They were kind of slow to remembering that he said he was going to rise again after the, on the third day. Uh, he, and then Christians, well, as Christians, because we know this, the end story, we don't have to fear, fear death. We don't have to worry. You know, we talk about the world out here going nuts, and I'm seeing stuff, oh, yeah, within a few months or so, yeah, there's no... Yeah, 90% of the world population is going to be gone. You, who knows what's going to happen? God does. I don't have to worry about it. Because I know I'm his. We're his. We don't have to worry. Now, people may go nuts. We don't have to. We've got God. He is our peace. He's our joy. He's our life. No matter what. Now we may have fears. Uh, but through faith in Jesus. We have the assurance of his presence with us and in us, and that should relieve us of all our fears. See, God's word assures us that when a believer dies, he's present with the Lord. And when a loved one dies, we grieve. We grieve his or her loss. It's a loss for us. We will miss that person greatly. We can receive peace though, knowing that one day we're going to be reunited. We will be reunited. People suffer and struggle here on earth. We have our aches and our pains. We have our heartaches and our sorrows. We get older and we can't do things like we used to. We may have illnesses. But when we enter God's presence, all sorrow and pain is wiped away. And we experience that greater joy of life in life than we've ever known here on earth. So my question is, do you have that assurance within your life that when you die, you're going to go be with him? God wants us to know. He said in John, 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. That's why he's given us this. That's why it's in writing, that we know him, that we have eternal life. If you are uncertain, and would like, and uh, let me know. We'll get together. We'll talk. And if you realize that you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then I, then I tell you that we do need to get together and talk, and I'll show you how you can know him. And because Jesus is the resurrection of life, we don't have to fear death, but we can live life in the fullest, become all God wants us to be. And we should have the same attitude that Paul had in 2 Corinthians 5, 9, where he says, therefore, also, therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home 
or absent to be pleasing to him. That's our goal. That's my desire. I want to be pleasing to him. I'll let him take care of my life. And, and, uh, and as I shared with the kids, the more you get into God's word, the more you get to know him, the more you know him, the more you love him. The more he, you, you want to serve him, you avoid the things of the darkness, and you experience his joy, his fullness, and his presence constantly. And we can't act, ask for anything greater. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, I thank you so much for your love, for your mercy, your grace. We thank you for this assurance, this guarantee that we have eternal life and that we will spend eternity with you because of what you did as we have given our lives to you. And if anyone does have doubts, Father, and if there are someone and just knows that he or she is not ready to meet you, I pray that you'll put it on their heart to, to get right with you today. And I just pray that you will bring comfort and strength and peace to those who have lost loved ones, and all of us have. And uh, But we thank you for that hope, that assurance, that one day we will all be together, singing your praises, basking in your glory, enjoying eternal life in its fullest glory. And we thank you for that promise, that assurance, in Jesus' name, amen. The song we're going to be singing is Amazing Grace. As we think about his grace, we don't deserve anything that he has offered us or that he's given us. We don't deserve it. It's all out of action.